All right, let's begin. First of all, welcome everybody to Supply Chain Risk Management Best Practices. And first of all, before we get going, I want to congratulate you on making a great decision to invest 45 minutes of your time to learn from the experts that have been brought to you today. And I always acknowledge people who are taking time out of the busyness of their schedule to invest in themselves. And if you think about it, there's this old saying that says, says uh, professional education can make you a living, but self-education is what can make you a fortune. And you know, when this product was well over a month ago, the decision by Sterling was, we want to step up and be the market's best educators. And if you follow and track any majorly successful company, the best companies are the ones that are providing the most resources to the audience and the best resources to give in today's world is education-based marketing. And that's exactly what this is. If you think about what kind of person it takes to carve out time to, to listen to the experts that we brought you here, or that Sterling has brought you here, to write things down, to take notes, and to ask questions, it takes a special person to do that. But if you study anybody who's been successful, whether it's in professional sports or acting, business, or the government, these are people that are constantly on the search to get the best information from the best people. Because modeling, finding somebody who is an expert in a certain field and learning from those people is the fastest way to create personal growth, growth and professional growth. It speeds up the learning curve. So today, we're going to talk in depth with our experts, who I'll introduce here in a moment, about supply chain risk management best practices. And we're going to navigate keys to creating a secure supply chain while navigating the current critical challenges that we're all facing. I want to start off with a quote from Jeff Moore, who's one of the senior vice presidents at Sterling, who's brought this briefing to you today. And he's one of our panelists as well, who says, a breach in one, one vendor supply chain, a routine software update that installs malware, a rogue component added during manufacturing, a worm siphoning data could affect not only the vendor's operations, but also the operations of its business partners and its customers. It's never been more critical than today with everything going on in our climate. So over the next few minutes, here's what we're going to be covering. We're going to do introductions and overviews, which are next. Then we're going to get into keys, discussing keys to creating a secure supply chain. We're going to dive into the importance of knowing your risk. And then we're going to talk about securing the last mile. At the end, we're going to have an executive summary of everything we discussed, and we'll be taking your questions. Those of you that have used this awesome program, WebEx, before, you know that there's a section where you can type in your questions. There's also a section of which you can chat. But if you have a question that's top of mind, either write it down on a piece of paper and ask it at the end, or put it in the queue. We've got experts from Sterling, we've got experts from Cisco, and we have experts from Dell to answer your questions here in this brief amount of time that we have together. Now, let's face it, everybody, there are some key challenges facing the supply chain. Some of the challenges that we're reading about, and many of us are experiencing right now, is reducing and eliminating supply chain risks, knowing who you're buying from, the ongoing importance of TAA, navigating that last mile. Then there's LPTA. And here's something that I hear over and over again is lowest price does not mean best value. And the fact that in today's marketplace, making a money decision over a price decision can work out better in most cases for the long term. We're going to talk about gray market and bad actors, vulnerabilities that can be introduced during any phase of the ICT life cycle. And then we're going to get into design, development, and production, distribution, acquisition, deployment, maintenance, and disposal. It's a lot to talk about here in this short amount of time. Now, to tee us up, to, to lend their expertise, are experts from Cisco, or excuse me, experts from Sterling, experts from Cisco, and experts from Dell. From Sterling, we have Jeff Moore, who's the senior vice president. Now, Jeff has 17 years in procuring technology in the federal government. He specializes in secure supply chain, and he's a member of multiple advisory committees. 
from Cisco, we have Christina Johnson, a 13-year veteran at Cisco who's responsible for driving best-in-class sales and operations planning for North America. And we have John Amos, who's the Supply Chain Assurance Program Director for Dell. Now, John is an Army veteran with over 20 years experience at Dell in manufacturing, engineering, supply chain, and logistics. He represents Dell on several key public-private partnerships in industry forums. So we brought you the best of the best. It's your job now to take great notes, to ask the questions you want to ask that Sterling has brought you. Now let's talk about some of the disturbing trends that are in the market right now. Independent research and direct feedback tells us this. Number one, last year alone, there were more than 300 major cybersecurity incidents. That represents a 78% increase in supply chain attacks from 2018 to 2019. There's a constant battle to keep delivery capabilities secure while battling against adversaries who are well-funded. In addition to that, we've got to stay on top of new regulation, new mandates, tight budgets, and changing personnel. These are ongoing challenges not to mention the multiple threats and opportunities. Those threats include everything from adversarial threats, that's tampering and counterfeit, non-adversarial, which is poor quality or even natural disasters, we're in one right now. There's internal vulnerabilities that we all experience, which are organizational procedures. And then there are external vulnerabilities, which is part of an organization's supply chain. On top of all of that, we're constantly battling risk management while still getting best price. Today, we're going to key in on three areas of focus, and we're going to talk about how to navigate these. Number one is creating a secure supply chain. That'll include the definition as it relates to Sterling, as it relates to Cisco, and as it relates to Dell of secure supply chain. We're going to talk about managing risk in supply chain and knowing your customer and understanding their standards around risk. Then we're gonna take the next step and get into the details of actually knowing your risk. We're gonna answer questions like why TAA is not the same as secure supply chain management. We're gonna discuss the ongoing need for vetting and securing your suppliers and get into you know, a question that I'm guessing a lot of you are asking right now is the cloud worth the security risk. And lastly, we're gonna talk about navigating that last mile. We're going to get into the details of the risks of gray market product, keys to avoiding counterfeit, knowing your reseller, and taking a more active role in vetting your suppliers along with contract risks. Let's get into the first section, critical components of a secure supply chain. And this is where I'm going to lean on the brain power of our experts. And I think a very first good question that we can start with is, Let's define secure supply chain. And we're going to go in order here, and we're going to go to John, and then I'm going to ask Jeff, and then we're going to ask Christina. John Amos from Dell, how do you and your company define secure supply chain? At first, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in the webinar. Thanks, Gene, for moderating, and, and Sterling for asking Dell to help lead this very important conversation. Uh, for those of you that aren't on the panel, I do strongly suggest you, you do ask questions. Make sure we cover the specific topics that you're interested in learning about. Uh, so I'm going to start by breaking the rules already. Uh, I'm going to answer the question with another question, uh, putting it from the customer point of view. Can I trust that the IT product that I'm purchasing is exactly what I expected, nothing more, nothing less? Or if you're looking at a service, can I trust that the products that are being leveraged to provide me that service that I'm purchasing are exactly what I expected, nothing more, nothing less? I don't believe a customer can know that without answering additional questions. Were the products, whether it's hardware or software, designed with security built in? Do the processes in place to produce the product, the system itself, the components that go into the product, do they have sufficient protections in place to ensure that what's produced is exactly what was designed? Mm -hmm. And then are there adequate protections in place to ensure that the products aren't tampered with as they move throughout the supply chain all the way until delivery? Uh, as a, a high level answer from a Dell standpoint, 
it is it's it's about strategy of a defense and depth and defense and breadth layers of protections throughout the entire supply chain and product life cycle from cradle to grave excellent john thank you christina representing cisco how do you define secure supply chain yeah well thanks number one for the invitation looking forward to uh, a nice hour here I think I would agree with a lot of what John was just saying, but I mean, just at very high level, it's minimizing the risk for supply chain logistics, um, having the ability to identify, assess, and prioritize any risk management to us, um, protecting our checkpoints, our assets, the infrastructure, and ma maintaining a secure chain of custody from end to end. And again, also um, need to ensure that we're following all the protocols and um, government from government agencies. And I think bottom line is that nobody runs a supply chain from point A to Z. Um, and you need to have a robust process in place to maintain the integrity of your supply chain and mitigate risk. Christina, you mentioned custody. Can you just elaborate on that word? You mentioned that in one of our earlier conversations. Yes. So I mean, just the ma maintaining, managing the supply chain custody, I mean, just having um, control points in place. And again, when we cover TAA, I think that that will be um, something interesting from if we are doing substantial transformation to a product that we're able to maintain the chain of custody from the time that we receive material until we turn that product over to a customer. Who has it? When did they have it? Um, when is it with our logistics team? So you need to be able to maintain that life cycle of that PID from end to end and Excellent. making sure that you have processes in place. Thank you, Christina. Let's go mm -hmm. to Jeff Moore, Senior Vice President at Sterling, who is the main sponsor of this educational briefing. Jeff, secure supply chain as it relates to Sterling in your purview. Yeah, so for, for us, you know, we don't actually manufacture anything um, like uh, Christina and John's organizations do. So. You know, we look at it, you know, truly from a chain standpoint, we need to make sure that whatever solution we're designing for our end user consumer, um, are they getting their quote unquote stuff, whatever that stuff may be, whether it's IT, you know, there's plenty of, you know, news about uh, COVID and, and uh, vaccines and things like that. But from an IT perspective, if we design a solution with Dell and Cisco, um, I need to be able to make sure that part of my supply chain risk management program reaches back into Dell and Cisco both, have they vetted their suppliers, the suppliers of their suppliers, so that as we move that um, component through the, their supply chain into the distribution network and the partner network, and then we bundle it into a solution and ultimately logistically deploy that to the end user, um, customer or consumer, has there been an appropriate chain of custody? Can we ensure that everything that, that Dell and Cisco have put in place, you know, that, that as a reseller or as a partner, that it doesn't fall down at the last minute. So I think, you know, the reason we call it a chain, if you think of links in a chain, every link in that chain has to be equally as strong um, so that we can deliver the right customer experience. Excellent, excellent. All right, let's keep going on this. And by the way, we already have questions coming in from the Q&A. If you have a question for one of the experts or a general question, type it in. They're all getting put together right now and we'll address questions as we go and at the end. So make sure you stay to the end because sometimes the answers to your specific questions are where some of the best information resides. Let's keep talking about secure supply chain. So now that we've defined it, what I want you to each talk about is some of the bullets here, ongoing pressures to bring more back to the United States. Discuss the ongoing drive for more production capacity itself. Protecting against theft of IP. Establishing security measures down to the component levels. These are things that a lot of people are thinking about here. So I'd like to go back to the committee. We'll start with John, then we'll go to Christina from Cisco, then we'll go to Jeff from Sterling. Give your perspective on what you're doing to assure secure supply chain, knowing that theft is out there, uh, demand for more U.S. productivity, security measures all the way down to the component levels, which we'll talk about later, present serious risks to both the customers and the vendors. 
John, you want to go first? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, definitely. So Dell takes a very holistic approach. It has to be cradle to grave. It has to be uh, layers of protections throughout the entire supply chain, throughout the entire uh, the life cycle of the solutions that we uh, design and deliver to our customers. Uh, a lot of times the controls that are in place are overlapping. Sometimes they have redundant protections in place. Uh, but I really like pointing toward the NIST uh, uh, guideline out there on uh, supply chain. It's the uh, NIST SP 800-161. And it really calls out supply chain risks as being in four buckets, uh, security, integrity, quality, and resilience. And you have to have these overlapping protections for each of those big buckets or the pillars as they call them. From a security standpoint, you have to have physical security, cyber security, personnel security. The, these protections have to be in place at every part of your supply chain. It's not just good enough to have them at the factory. Uh, integrity, you can look at from a hardware or software standpoint, things that you do to make sure you're protecting against counterfeit, to protect against people within your supply chain uh, from tampering with the products. And then obviously quality is something that uh, has been high on everybody's mind for a long time, making sure that you have repeatable, predictable processes, uh, documented processes that you make sure that you follow. And then resilience being the fourth pillar, this is something that's uh, become of a, a lot more real to people recently with uh, a pandemic and how that impacts global supply chains. Uh, but that's been something, you know, from a, you know, whether it's weather events or uh, strikes at a, at a port or any type of issue that might happen within the entire supply chain, you know, geopolitical influences, things like that you have to have plans in place that address business continuity. And within those plans, you have to look at security, integrity, and quality. You can't have security plans without looking at the other factors. So they are overlapping controls that extend throughout the entire supply chain. Uh, and that's really having that holistic view, that defense and depth, defense and breadth approach is what works well for us. Hey, John, we already have our first question coming in from the audience. And as a reminder, if you have questions for any of the experts or general questions, put them in the Q&A and we're going to get these taken care of. This, this whole event is designed for you. John, here's a quick question. What are the large primes like Dell planning, uh, planning to do to make sure that their small, mid-sized part of the chain can continue to do the work while they wait to get certified? especially for DOD Pathfinder contracts this year? Sure, so I'm, I'm personally not familiar with uh, the DOD Pathfinder contract, but I, I do know at the high level, uh, we have things in place for our small and mid medium uh, partners that are channel providers as well as suppliers to us. Uh, obviously, it's a very important part of Dell's uh, approach to having a, a diverse supply base, making sure that the people that are contributing are able to comply. So events like this even are opportunities for our partners to learn more about what it, it is that has to take place. Uh, we have additional sessions with our key partners to make sure that as new regulations come out, and I'm, I'm assuming the question is really geared a lot towards CMMC and uh, the, the NIST 800-171 guidelines out there on protecting CUI. Uh, all of those things, there's a lot of opportunities for companies that do need help to reach out to our team. And, and we definitely are all about making sure that the entire supply chain uh, is able to meet the customer requirements. So uh, we, we definitely value the opportunities that we have uh, with partners that are small, medium-sized businesses. Thank you, John. Let's move to Christina Johnson from Cisco, talking about secure supply chain and the pressure to bring things back to the US, including product production capacity, theft of IP. I mean, all these things are critically important to all companies. What's your take on that, Christina? Yeah, I think we've seen that over the last couple of years, even with, um, with tariffs um, and what's going on globally. Um, Obviously, the cost of bringing material back into the U.S. in production is extremely expensive for most of our companies. Um, but it's something, as far as um, Cisco is, I mean, we're a global manufacturer. We're constantly looking at where do we build, 
Is it cheaper? Is it faster? Um, again, even with um, COVID-19, we've seen ourselves having to move production and material from our factories worldwide to be able to, to continue with um, what John was saying as far as uh, business resiliency. Um, but again, I think it comes down to managing and having controls in place and, and sharing that information and make sure you're not working in silos um, within these different groups. And um, I mean, having, again, rigorous internal and external audits um, and integrating that supply chain throughout the company. Um, and I know John mentioned this as well. Um, we're actually also um, proactively working on this 800-53 Rev 5, where in the past there was only one um, one specific supply chain control. We're looking at 11 new ones coming on. So again, it, how do you proactively look at that and, and prepare for that to make sure that we are in compliance with the next level of regulations? Excellent. Thank you for that, Christina. Jeff Moore from Sterling, secure supply chain. You've defined it. Now let's let's take it a little bit deeper than definition. What is happening with Sterling as it relates to this? Um, you know, I think there's a, a certainly an awareness um, from a sourcing perspective um, around the ongoing pressure to bring on or basically onshore production capacity. Um, I, don't, I don't unless you've you know, lived under a rock for the last six months or something, you know, you're certainly aware of a lot of those discussions. You know, Will Roper um, mentioned it in the Government Matters uh, webinar that they did a couple days ago about the need for the DOD to have these discussions as we move into post-COVID. How do you supply, you know, the critical components to weapon systems, IT components, things like that? You know, it, it'd really be interesting to see, I think, a, a study of, you know, how many of our um, end user consumers, whether it be commercial, private sector, um, you know, or governments are willing um, to adopt a, a US based manufacturing platform or a requirement, but you've got to also understand from a risk mitigation standpoint, that's going to drive cost. And, you know, we know, you know, we've had conversations with both Dell, Intel, some of our other partners um, about that. Intel actually is one of the few um, chip manufacturers that still has US based um, production facilities. So, you know, how do we, how do we not uh, overwhelm them? You know, how do we look at bringing those things back into um, the U.S. And, and to Christina's point, and and certainly John's, what's the cost to that? You know, that's there are some economics to that that we would have to consider as well. But maybe you know, maybe the risk is such that. Uh, um, you know, we need to consider it. And I, and I think it'd be, you know, maybe somebody that Gallup or somebody that could do a study, you know, of end user consumers, that'd be an interesting data point. Jeff, thank you for that. Let's move to the next section. So we've talked about critical components of a secure supply chain. Now we move a little bit deeper here, and that is the importance of knowing risk. And what I heard in all of our prep calls and our emails back and forth, in so many words, this is my version of what you told me is, what you don't know can hurt you in the organization for everybody that's in the audience right now. So we're going to talk about keys to effectively navigating TAA, maintaining compliance in light of the ongoing economic pressures and LPTA. We're going to talk about understanding the False Claims Act. And most importantly is proactive behavior versus reactive behavior. So let's go to John in knowing risk. Actually, we're going to go with Christina, then John, then Jeff, then John. Get my orders right. My apologies. Okay. Thanks, Gene. So, yeah, this one, actually, when we were talking about this in our prep, it was because um, I think the three of us have heard um, the misconception that TAA is tied to security, when, in fact, um, they're not tied to security. So, GSA scheduled contracts, I mean, they are subject to the Trade Agreements Act, meaning that all the products listed on the scheduled contract must be manu either manufactured or substantially transformed in the United States or in a designated country. Um, so, of course, it has nothing to do with um, security. Um, what we do at Cisco 
is number one is understand what is substantial transformation and what does it mean so we're that so we ensure that within our tools that we are providing TA compliant products so we know that the customer is getting what they asked for. Um, we also have controls in place. If something happens, our tools will actually catch that before it's either manufactured or shipped to the customer. Again, ensuring that we are in compliance or at least we're able to stop something and mitigate um, any risks there. Um, also, um, working closely with our global tax and customs as well as our product operations so they understand what TAA is. Because of all the different changes, uh, changing something from one manufacturing site to another might make a, what was a TAA product TAA eligible, non-TAA eligible. So, I mean, that's um, constantly evolving. Um, so, that, so that's what we have right now with um, TAA. Again, it's having those controls in place. And again, it's, it's ever evolving and, and, and making sure that you're working with your cross-functional teams to identify and put um, robust processes in place. And for those of you that are in the audience, if you have any questions for Christina Johnson from Cisco, feel free to add those and we'll make sure and cover all your questions before we get finished today. All right, let's go to Jeff. Jeff Moore from Sterling, risk assessments, risk adversary. Yeah, you know, it, it, Christina makes a great point uh, about TAA and I've, uh, I'm shocked and dismayed at how many people actually, you know, to her point, think that TAA is a secure supply chain um, risk mitigation strategy. It's really not. You know, it's back to the politics again. It's a, it, it, it really doesn't solve your problem, and we see it a lot with uh, consumers. But you now, there's other things that you know, LPTA and, and puts an undue amount of pressure, um, or lowest price technically acceptable for those of you that don't understand what the acronym is puts an undue amount of pressure on um, smaller resellers and partners to maybe behave inappropriately, um, can induce some significant risk um, into the environment. You know, we talk about, you know, certain contracts that we have that, you know, we know that the DOD is moving away and the federal government as a whole, thankfully, are moving away from LPTA. Um, it, it's a lot easier to influence a small reseller than it is a um, gigantic multinational corporation like Cisco or Dell. Um, you know, a thousand dollars here, or a couple thousand dollars there that can mean the difference between winning and losing the program um, to a small reseller sometimes encourages poor behavior. And so we're, we're glad to see that moving away. Um, I think the government maybe needs to use the hammer from a false claims act a little more than what they have in the past where they've been defrauded. Um, I can tell you, you know, just an example that happened this last week where we had a customer that uh, supposedly bought some product from um, another reseller or another partner and it shows up on their dock and it's got made in China stamped all over it. And, you know, they get to dig it into it and it's gray market equipment. And, you know, those things happen. So I think, you know, the, the main point is you got to know what that risk is. There may be times where it's appropriate. Um, I, I would be curious um, to see what those would be, though. But there, there are times where it's appropriate maybe to buy some gray market equipment if it's, you know, end of life stuff or something like that. And then you know, something that's not been talked about that, that I think is appropriate in this particular context is from a cloud perspective, there's this giant move to cloud. There's some significant security risks with cloud, even if, you know, if it's a gov cloud or whatever that, you know, or, you know, what AWS is doing, do you really know what those components are inside of that data center? Um, are, are you okay with that risk? Are you okay with not knowing? Those are some of the things that I think from a proactive versus reactive, you need to be a, a better steward and be more of an aggressive questioner of your supplier to make sure that um, one, you are getting product if it's coming directly, but two, if it's going to the cloud, what does that cloud environment look like? What are they sourcing it from? Do they have a secure supply chain program, things like that? Hey, Jeff, in terms of what you don't know can hurt you and your organization and you're talking about the cloud, what's, what's an example of, you know, somebody thought they were doing the right thing, they just didn't know any different and it ended up being tremendously negative or direct negative impact? Yeah, you know, we've I mean, we've all seen instances or, you know, there was a, 
you know, it's, it's been in the news recently, some of the pressure or some of the things that happened with Supermicro where they had a back door that was installed into um, some of the chips that they had uh, utilized in their server builds that were, you know, part of the, the, the infrastructure for some of your largest cloud providers. So if you're, you know, attempting to move sensitive or in some cases classified data to a cloud environment and, um, you know, not to pick on AWS, but um, I'll pick on them a little bit. Uh, you know, what what is in their data center? If you don't know that, and all of a sudden they have a whole bunch of super micro stuff, or they, you know, God forbid, bought a whole bunch of pizza box servers that they're using in their data center from two guys in a truck um, that may have been shipped in from a warehouse in Southeast Asia. How, how do you, you know, how do you assure that the data and, and the infrastructure that your platform applications are residing on meet your security risk. You know, those are those are a couple that jump off the page at me or I, we've had experience with recently. Let's, think, let's continue this conversation around knowing risk and what you don't know can hurt you and your organization. John Amos from Dell, give us your perspective on this. Sure. So, uh, you know, from a federal agency standpoint, for instance, this is something that's been a little bit of a revelation, I think, over the last 10 years or so. But it's that, you know, when you go out to acquire IT products, there's a lot of, of uh, different silos within each agency that all are stakeholders in that decision. And while the acquisition team is, is being held accountable, their job is all about, you know, making sure they are, you know, economies of scale, get the lowest price available. LPTA has actually been a sore spot for a lot of security sensitive customers. The other parts of the organization, whether it's the IT security or the counterintelligence or the operations side, they need to make sure that it's actually doing what it needs to do and it's appropriately protected. So there have been multiple protections out there to try to overcome that fundamental challenge of putting so much emphasis on lowest cost. Uh, you can either better articulate what technically acceptable means, or you can adopt efforts to, to make security a foundational requirement to the acquisition process, or what's been uh, proposed uh, in, a, in another writing that got some pretty pretty high visibility, making security an equal on that, you know, the three-legged three -legged stool that people refer to as the cost time performance add security as a fourth leg of that stool as part of the acquisition process. Uh, you can't just keep purchasing ICT products for the lowest price and expect that security is built in, uh, which is exactly, the, exactly what Jeff has been talking about. Now, other compliance requirements like TAA are, are seen by Dell as just being a ticket to entry. Uh, as Christina mentioned, compliance does not guarantee security. Um, you know, the TA listing for designated countries includes, a, you know, countries that are known globally to have a lot of corruption in those countries. It also excludes countries that are actually allies of the U.S. For instance, not all NATO allies are on the designated country list. In fact, one of the five eyes, New Zealand, was just added about five years ago. So that list is not about military or political alliances. Uh, so people need to be aware of that. Uh, just to, to wrap up the thought, really the changing threat landscape requires intimate knowledge of your supply chain. Uh, and, and I'll just echo some of Christina's points. Traceability is nice. You know, the type of transparency that lets you know where something originated is, is great. But what's really important is the chain of custody, knowing where did it go after it was made, who had control of it, who had access to it, what protections are in place to prevent or detect tampering up until it gets into the customer environment. So, John, that's excellent. And once again, if you're watching this right now and you have a burning question, put it in the Q&A. We're going to be at questions here in the next 10 minutes. We want to make sure that we're addressing your concerns, your curiosity, anything is you want to know. It's not often you're going to be able to be on one live call with three experts from three, three of the most uh, recognized brands in the business. So take advantage of this time together. Let's move to our last segment, which is talking about securing the last mile. And the sub headline of that, as you can see on the video right now, says mitigating your potential weakest link. This is a piece that in our prior calls and our preparation calls and the emails we've exchanged, all of you perked up to say, this is critically important. 
So that includes knowing your suppliers, knowing who you're working with, including downstream partners, how to ask the tough questions, confirming that the client gets what they paid for, contractual avenues, economic pressures combined with risk tolerance. And I'm gonna start with Jeff Moore to tee this up. I know this is a subject matter that you're super passionate about. I had a chance to read several articles that you wrote about this subject matter, very impressive. And we wanna get your you know, latest and greatest perspective on this important piece. Yeah, I, uh, this is by far and away one of the things I'm most passionate about. And as you were uh, quick to point out in the intro of my 17 years of history as evidenced by my uh, uh, gray hair, but this is this is an ongoing problem, and it's not getting any better. Um, you know, the, the thing about it is there is a tremendous amount, and as, as we talked during the LPTA discussion, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on this last mile, and the, and the last mile really represents your your large system integrators, your partners, your resellers, those sort of folks. Um, and, and sometimes money makes people do stupid things. And it, it, when it comes time to compromising the supply chain, you know, if if great companies like Cisco and, and Dell expend a tremendous amount of time and effort and resources to ensure that it's pristine, that the product you're getting is exactly what it gets to, and then sometimes we forget about this last this, this last mile or this you know small step to fulfillment is where it's much easier for our adversaries um, to exploit. You know, I mentioned you know, economic pressure. Um, we have an awful lot of uh, bad actors. I wouldn't say a lot. That's unfair. We have an, we have some bad actors um, in the reseller community that are after the, the buck more than they are about taking care of their customers, and it leads to poor decisions. Um, and we, we've seen some contractual um, efforts, you know, in particular, if you, here's an example I would use that I gave you guys the other day. If you go out to GSA right now, and if you Google Cisco or, you know, search for Cisco or Dell, you're going to come up with 35, 40 different uh, um, contractors that claim to have those folks on schedule. Well, the, the fact is there's only five entities that have Cisco, uh, have a letter of supply with Cisco and are authorized um, to provide that via GSA. Dell's is around 24 or 25, and you're going to see 40, 45. And we see abuses of that all the time. And, and I think that the critical component to this is, you know, our, our contracting officials, our buyers, they need to be empowered to ask some more tough questions. You know, to John's point around LPTA and getting back to best value, I, I think that there needs to be a, a more rigorous debate and um, I guess discovery of what your suppliers are doing, who they're working with. Um, we get we get bombarded on a daily basis from people that want to sell us quote unquote authentic Cisco equipment or authentic Dell equipment. And you know, come to find out, you know, in my previous example, it's it's back in to some warehouse in Southeast Asia that, you know, neither Dell nor Cisco has any clue as to what's going on with that. And uh, it's not necessarily always a DOD problem either, you know, from a classified data standpoint. You know, our, our, our good friends um, in, in the other part of the world, they're after intellectual property um, so that they can exploit that. They're after economic gain, you know, certainly the national security place or standpoint, um, you know, and then you see things like ransomware and those sort of things. So I, it's, you know, the, the one bullet that you put up there as I um, tie this all together is, I would strongly encourage any end user consumer to learn how to ask the tough questions to vet those um, suppliers. You know, are they CMMC eventually, or are they OTIP certified? What have they done from a secure supply chain, you know, supply chain risk management standpoint to ensure that you're getting exactly what you're paying for and what you need? So. I'll get off my soapbox a little bit about that. All right, we got more questions coming in. Christina, do you want to talk about securing the last mile? And then we'll go to John. Christina, your audio is off. Okay, sorry about there that. There we go. 
Yeah. So I was saying um, that I agree 100% with what um, Jeff was saying as far as um, the controls and asking those tough questions. Um, within Cisco, if we're managing that final leg and the delivery to the customer, obviously we have a lot more control in place. We have um, suppliers and third party logistics um, teams that we've already vetted. We know um, how they manage their own supply chain, um, who they're associated with, I mean, where are they purchasing their parts and services from. Um, I think some of the difficulty, and um, I, I think it was John that mentioned as far as cost. Um, some of the issues that I would see there is, again, in order to save a little bit of money, who are your transportation companies? If our customers, if our partners are doing their own transportation, once Cisco hands that over, we lose visibility to that order. Hmm. Um, so from, from from our standpoint, I think, again, it would be for, it would benefit us and I think oftentimes um, the customers, if they would allow Cisco to do that end-to-end -end piece, just to have that visibility of that um, visibility of that order from end to end, and let and let us do that vetting of third party logistics teams. Excellent, John Amos, securing the last mile. Talk about the importance of that and steps you're taking to make sure that it is as good as it can be. Sure, and, and I'll actually shift it a little bit. So a lot of the discussion around securing the last mile really has to start with introspection on the customer side. The customer has to understand their own risk tolerance, their own risk appetite. Um, with direct knowledge about how the product's going to be used, they need to determine whether additional protections need to be put into place to help ensure that those products aren't targeted while they're traversing through the supply chain. Uh, the customer needs to understand, determine the likelihood, the impact of a successful attack on the provider's supply chain that might result in the product being tampered with by an adversary. Uh, that's fundamental to the federal customer's uh, responsibility is understanding that. So they need to understand at what point in the supply chain is the customer name and address associated with the product? Uh, who has access to the product once it's been identified or associated? Is the information being provided on a need to know basis or is that information readily visible to others? All of that is an important part of the customer understanding that uh, threat landscape. Um, to us, once you understand your, your risk tolerance or risk appetite, um, you know, for the most part, we, in general, we trust US commercial transportation carriers, you know, the public, trust them to pick up a box or a pallet from point A and deliver it to point B. Um, but many customers don't understand how many touch points, how many people, how many opportunities that there are for tampering between point A and point B. Uh, that's where, once again, asking the tough questions of your providers, how exactly is the product going to flow from your factory to our dock? Uh, that's something that you need to make sure you understand. So, uh, and then I'll just reiterate Jeff's point uh, about uh, you know the way Dell approaches our federal authorized resellers. We have a list of our partners. We You can purchase a Dell through a lot of channels today, but if you're a federal entity, you need to purchase from one of the Dell federal authorized resellers, which our federal sales team can verify at any time who's on that list. But these partners like Sterling have established that trusted relationship with Dell. We have confidence that they're meeting the appropriate requirements. So there is a little bit more that the customers can do to make sure they're addressing that last mile. Thank you, John. And once again, to the audience, I've got, we've got questions coming in via email and text, but use your Q and A there and that way I can see them. Let's move into the questions. And before I do that, first of all, thank you panelists. Everybody's busy right now and the fact that you're taking time and all the preparation you did to get here to deliver, we are super grateful for you. As a summary of what we've discussed before we go to the Q&A is we've got to make sure we're looking at risk, the fact that risk and vulnerability exists within the federal government, critical infrastructure, and commercial business. There are ongoing threats that are posed to threaten your network security, your data centers, and classified and confidential information. It was just said over and over again, know your resellers and be prepared to ask the hard questions. Next, take the time to educate and train contracting officers and buyers 
to look beyond the bill of materials and part numbers. You need to advocate fiercely to maintain a true secure supply chain. And remember, the lowest price does not always, always make the happiest customer. The risk we see now will only get more aggressive and dangerous over the course of time. And before we go into Q&A, do everything in your power to secure your supply chain. Now let's go to Q&A and I'm gonna look at what's on my phone and what's in the chat box. I have one right now, and this can be answered by anybody that just came in. It says, one more question. What do you think about the use of blockchain technology in secure supply chain? Is there a standard being developed or discussed? Who wants to take that first one? I can jump in. So, uh, yeah, blockchain is definitely being discussed. Um, that's something that uh, has been on. Uh, it's one of those buzzwords that any conference that you go to around supply chain security or assurance or integrity, uh, at some point, people are going to talk about blockchain. There's good reasons for that. There's a lot of potential in that technology. There's some challenges also associated with it. So, I, th I think in general industry, you know, Dell, Cisco, others, we're looking at it as being a, an opportunity. It's still in that potential stage, but there's still things that we would need to uh, really figure out and work through before we're ready to jump in and adopt that specifically. But the bottom line is establishing ways to have chain of custody of components through your supply chain is, is very important. And that's one of the things that blockchain can potentially be leveraged to help you do. Thank you. Christina, comments on blockchain technology as it relates to secure supply chain. Then I'll go to Jeff. Yeah, so this is um, something that Cisco is looking at as well. And I think um, as John referenced right now, I mean, it's as far, you need to be able to control and have visibility from end to end. Um, I think we had a, a customer about a year, year and a half ago needing TAA material. They, um, the end customer quarantined an entire shipment because of our um, the China Airlines labels. Mm -hmm. And it took us, I mean, for in order for them to take that out of quarantine, we did have to go back, and as John referenced, at what point is the customer's name actually associated and who's seen it? Because the product did come in from China um, after substantial transformation in a TAA-eligible country. So we did have to go back and prove to the end customer that nowhere along our supply chain was the customer referenced at all. And the only time it referenced was actually when it came into the U.S. already, cleared U.S. customs, new labels were put on. So it's, again, about having that visibility um, and processes in place. Thank you. Jeff Moore, blockchain as it relates to secure supply chain. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've had those discussions internally. I, I know my... Um, logistics and technical staff have looked at it, um, but you know the reality is that it it will take um, you know effort at the OEM level, you know either Christina or John or their companies or you know other folks like that, you know if they begin to implement it and um, you know we're we're prepared. We've had those discussions internally, um, and I know that some of the uh, quote unquote smart kids on our side have been in discussions with. Um, both Cisco and Dell and others on on how to implement it, but you know we're kind of that quote unquote last mile again, so we'll have to uh, follow their lead. Excellent, thank you. Hey, we have about five minutes for some questions, and I have some here. First one is for Christina, and it it says something. I'm trying to paraphrase what I have here. The there was a bullet on establishing security measures down the component level. And you had mentioned, and I, I call this out too, because I just hadn't heard this term, supply chain, chain of custody. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so again, supply chain custody, um, what we consider it is again, having a process in place. So developing um, key control points mm -hmm. within manufacturing, um, identifying material at the component level with um, a, a uniform marking system, um, having um, systems in place to keep records and documentation, um, assigning responsibilities, accountabilities, who has what, when. 
um, setting up internal and external audits um, that drive compliance and process integrity within, um, so, um, within supply chain, and then integrate that supply chain custody throughout your supply chain organization. So it's not just manufacturing, it's not just make and deliver, it's not just logistics. So you have a cohesive plan end to end as far as visibility and maintaining that integrity of that as, as you build and deliver to the customer end to end. Excellent, thank you very much. The next question is for John Amos from Dell. Interesting question, what types of supply chain threats are the most concerning to you right now? Sure, so uh, really the threats have grown in complexity over time and they, they really seem to be trending in that direction. Um, bad actors are continuing to invest in opportunities to exploit global supply chains and the more complex threats that appear to be nation state resource, for instance, are, are really the most concerning because I mean, literally these are entities that can print their own money, throw seemingly unlimited resources at trying to find and exploit the weakest links. Uh, so, you know, the threats out there in a the supply chain include hardware and software, you know, from a software standpoint, backdoors, applications that monitor and report user behaviors, malware like Stuxnet, things like that. The complexity is, is on the rise. Hardware, you know, there's a mention earlier, Jeff talked about Supermicro, you know, the allegations that Bloomberg made back in late 2018 about uh, Supermicro's supply chain, their sub-tier supply being uh, infiltrated by a, a nation state. You know, even though everyone that was called out in that article denied that that took place and there wasn't really a smoking gun that got publicized, you know, Dell took that threat seriously. We immediately investigated, analyzed our own processes and controls to understand whether a similar attack may have been successful against our supply chain. And so we take every opportunity to learn and improve our processes to try to stay one step ahead of very motivated, very well-resourced bad actors that are out there. Yeah. Um, kind of to wrap it up, what, what I would just say is customers really need to be able to compare apples to apples. You know, LPTA may give you sour grapes uh, or you may get a worm in your apples. So you need to make sure that what you're looking at meets your security requirements, it meets your risk appetite. Thank you, John. Jeff Moore, are certain OEMs more vulnerable than others to supply chain risk? Uh, yeah, well, I think they're, they're more of a target. I wouldn't say they're more vulnerable to a risk. You know, obviously, um, you know, your largest IT providers, you know, Cisco and Dell, the, the threat landscape says that if you, you know, if you can attack one of the bigger guys, you know, your probability of success is higher. I, I certainly don't think that they're more vulnerable, but we do see um, more aggressive, more active tactics in going after the technology of your largest providers um, you know, of technology, whether that's software or hardware in the instance of, of Cisco and Dell. I, I will tell you that Cisco and Dell are um, two of the most aggressive at combating it um, and, and putting those measures in place to help ensure that our end users um, get what they ask for. There are um, maybe some more mid-tier companies that are a little more vulnerable. As I mentioned, I, I think that there's some vulnerabilities inside of the cloud construct um, more so maybe on the commercial side that gives me some pause. I just don't have enough data to understand that. But, uh, you know, certainly, um, as John mentioned, there's some nation state folks that are interested in attacking um, some of the largest uh, OEMs in the United States. Some are better at it uh, in defending themselves than others. Thank you for that, Jeff. Friends, as we wrap this up, I want to make sure that if you have a question that you want to just ask directly to our expert panelists, you want to make sure you have their email addresses and all of them are below. Jeff Moore, Senior Vice President at Sterling, jeff.moore at sterling.com. Christina Johnson, Sales Business Development Manager, Supply Chain Focus at Cisco, is John 
John's C99 at Cisco.com and John Amos, Supply Chain Assurance Program Director for Dell, John.Amos at Dell.com. And lastly, if you want more information, if you want to see some of the white papers that we sourced or cited the source of, you can certainly go now to www.securesupplychain.com. There will be a replay of this webinar if you want to go back and watch it again. If you want to share it with somebody within your organization, feel free to do so. This series that has been launched by Sterling, this educational series, you notice we're not pitching or selling or trying to brand position. This is purely to help the marketplace continue to grow and get even better at all times. It is Sterling's commitment to the marketplace to continue to explore what are some of the challenges and difficulties in the market, to bring together some of the best insights along with some of the best experts in the marketplace. Thank you to John for joining. Everybody's busy right now, but you know if you can combine the expertise of three great people and condense it into 50 minutes, that's a good investment of your time. And as a reminder, I'll end the same way that I started. There is no better investment than in yourself, in your market education, so you can show up even better to your internal team members, to your external clients, to all your partners and vendors. Continue to focus on educating yourself. Get the best resources and model the very best. On behalf of Sterling, thank you everybody for your time and attention. We're always welcome and open for your feedback. We're always welcome and open for other subject matter that you'd like to hear about. Have a great day on behalf of Sterling. Thank you.